The following interview was conducted with Glenn Tompkins, the Senior Associate Athletics Director, Business Intercollegiate Athletics for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, February 18, 2011, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. This is part two of the interview. Good afternoon, Mr. Tompkins. Good afternoon. Let's start with you are the um, Senior Associate Athletic Directors for Business. Which okay. Does, that's correct, and, and it doesn't mean a lot to m most people unless you're in athletics. Uh, m most people would think of it as the chief financial officer for the athletic department. Uh, I'm responsible for all of the business functions. Uh, and then reporting to me uh, is the associate athletic director for facilities. Uh, as a self-supporting uh, enterprise at Purdue, we are responsible for uh, paying for the construction, maintenance, renovation uh, of uh, all of our facilities. So it's, it's a pretty significant operation and Steve Zimmerman is in charge of that. Uh, I have the uh, athletic equipment room, which is responsible for all of the um, game and sports equipment, uh, apparel, uniform, you know, practice uniforms, game uniforms. Um, the HR function reports to me. Um, which is a little bit of an oxymoron for an accountant, but uh, it does, uh, be prim primarily because it's a business function. We uh, actually uh, established a position within athletics uh, specifically for HR about a year and a half ago. That position has a dual reporting relationship with central HR. Uh, and then we have an in-house travel agency. We have a contract with an external travel agency that specializes in sports uh, team travel and travel to sporting events like fan travel to bowl games. And they have two full-time staff um, manage a, a travel agency within our building. So they're on site? They're on site. Um, they're, they're just off the lobby of the IAF building where I'm at with 18 sports we have a significant amount of group travel, and we call it team travel, but it's group travel. Uh, some of it is international. Our golf team, uh, men's and women's golf teams are competing in Puerto Rico as we speak. Uh, and then all of the individual travel, uh, we, we all have our business trips to um, uh, Big Ten and National Association meetings, conferences, but then uh, all of the coaches engage in off-campus recruiting travel. Which is, which is a significant uh, portion of our travel business, and obviously recruiting is the lifeblood of any athletic program. So those are the areas that report to me. Uh, I have a dual reporting relationship. Uh, I report to the athletic director, and I report to Jim Allman, who's the senior vice president for business services. Um, but I've had a dual reporting relationship going back to my first job in engineering. So right, sure. um, it's always been sort of that liaison dotted line kind of thing. Right, and the, and uh, on the chart. You know, people have asked me, you know, what are the key functions of my position? And I always say, well, the first one is service. It's, uh, you know, financial management advice and counsel and uh, uh, financial services, payroll, budgeting, travel, and so on. The second is uh, to be the communications liaison between the area that I'm assigned to, which happens to be athletics now, it was ag before that, and development office and so on. Uh, be between the area I'm assigned to and the central administration. Um, you know, a lot of the business needs around campus are pretty comparable from department to department, maybe 80, 85 percent, you know, payrolls, payroll, travels, travel. Yeah. But then each area, whether it be ag or athletics or residence halls or libraries, have, have things about their operation that are unique and uh, where the one size doesn't fit all. And I've always felt like the position of the, of the departmental business managers, which is essentially what I am, it is to help the central offices understand those unique differences so that if there are exceptions to policies or maybe a, a different special request, a special request uh, um, you know, things to do with purchasing, that, uh, that that's part of my job is to is Who to handles the contracts for a lot of these, let's say for the travel and, and things of that sort? Does the university or does it do for athletics? Or does that vary among the departments? Um, within the athletics, I handle. Okay. A anything to do with contracting has to go through me. Um, we have coaches' contracts, you know, employment contracts that are much more detailed, much more specific, and have um, 
compensation component you just wouldn't see in other I'm other sure. employee you know other university employee contracts. Um, we have contracts for uh, that are related to marketing, um, concessions contracts, merchandising contracts. That's a big chunk. Which is a big a big area. Um, contracts uh, with sponsorships like Nike, for example. Uh, we have an eight-year contract. Do you put a time, does it vary? Do you put a time period on there with three or five years for renewal? Yes. Okay. And uh, the next obvious question is, well, how do you decide if it's three or five? <laughs> it's The out outsider, but I wouldn't ask, but it's, um, a good, it, it, it's good for research. And it really, it's going to, you know, and of course the easy answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on how often you want to renew that contract for whatever it is you're contracting for. And I've used uh, examples before. If, if, if it's buying pencils and paper, uh, you probably want to renew it maybe at least every two years just to make sure you're getting the best pricing and service and delivery. Because switching to another vendor for something like that is not disruptive to anybody. It's, in fact, it's probably pretty much invisible to, to sure, sure. our customers. Right. But when you're talking about a concessionaire for your events, um, a, a lot of how they do business has to do with how we want them to do business, how we, the kind of culture we're trying to create for our customers. And it takes a while to, get, to learn that, get used to us. Uh, right. and, and us you, to them. And us to them. And you, know, you, would, you would like to not have to, so it, whenever you change to another vendor, it is disruptive and you would like to not have to create that disruption. It's like if you have a new head, there's a learning curve. Absolutely, that has to, absolutely. For everybody involved, yeah. understand. So Similar. for an agreement like that, um, you probably would do a minimum of five years and also have some like um, easy renewal, easy extension opportunity where the university you're purchasing is not gonna you know, demand that you bid it out again. Okay. Um, some review process that says, yeah, we think it's going well, we think our pricing is good, uh, and the value we're getting out of the agreement uh, is is more than the potential value we might get by rebidding the agreement. Do you um, do you have to do it within the community or, or within the state, or can it vary? Does it, it can vary. Okay. Yeah. It varies on maybe the pro or the product or whatever you're talking about. It, exactly, and and the availability within the state. Sure. Our preference would be to to work sure. within the state. Oh sure. Um, or local. Lo or local. local. Right. Sure, and we you work out like a radius. Um, just as we would like to have in-state students, um, you know, the, it, it, the talent may not always be there. Right. Uh, and likewise, um, when we contracted with the, um, the travel agency we're using now, it's Anthony Travel and they're actually their headquarters is in South Bend, so it is within the state. But we were using a, um, an, a an agency within town and um, the agency, uh, Anthony Travel, has a, a um, volume of business and they have a national reach. They can negotiate. Their headquarters are in South Bend, though? In South Bend. Okay. So they can negotiate uh, arrangements with airlines, with hotels, that the local travel agency just didn't have the size. They don't have the scope. To, to be do. able to, to leverage sure. that. Right, right. So, um, it is a balance. Um, right. we, we, you know, we would prefer to stay within town we would prefer, prefer to stay within the state of Indiana, but at the end of the day, it has to be the best value for the operation. Right, good point, that's good. Um, let's see, the um, Athletic Affairs Committee, but the master plan, you people have, the, the university has a master plan and athletics fits into that. We, we do, yeah. and it's, uh, it's very parallel to the university's sure. master plan. I mean, the focus is on, on uh, student success and access and success, um, and we have, components of the athletic department that focus uh, primarily on uh, student athlete academics, student athlete welfare, and then NCAA compliance. Another ma major component is our facilities master plan. Uh, we put that together really just as we were finishing up the Ross Aid renovation and we put together a 25 year master plan that would be a road map that we could follow to initially um, eliminate deficiencies in existing facilities. And then as you got into the middle term of the, of the plan and then out into the right. uh, long term, we could think about new facilities, um, a, a new Mackey Arena. 
now remember, we were putting this plan together in 2002, uh, and at that time, we, we never envisioned we'd be in a position to do what we're doing today with Mac Arena. So, uh, but there was a planning along that line. There was a planning key, al right? and, and w with with several of our facilities, we had what we call interim plans to do some renovation to try to keep it usable for another 10 or 15, maybe 20 years. But then eventually, out 20 to 25 years, uh, we had to envision a replacement facility. And uh, uh, as long as we're talking about that, uh, th that was our plan. We, we looked at what we called the near term. We had about 10 or 11 projects some of which people are familiar with today, um, the Sp Spurgeon Indoor Golf Training Center out at the golf course, mm -hmm. the new indoor tennis facility. Uh, those were part of what we call the near term. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the midterm, we had envisioned a renovation of, of Mackey Arena. Um, and we, we started doing those as, as gift monies became available to address those projects. Right. So obviously um, Tom Spurgeon, who happens to be on the board of trustees, um, indicated an interest to provide a lead gift for an indoor golf training facility. He's an avid golfer. And then um, one of our, one of our uh, really great supporters, uh, Dennis Schwartz, um, indicated an interest to provide a lead gift for an indoor tennis facility uh, to honor uh, his late wife and so it's the Dennis and Mary Lou Schwartz tennis facility so you know you have to take advantage of those right. opportunities but you also at the same time on the same page have some plans in place if that comes across you're ready to jump you have to be ready to do it absolutely right. Right. another thing we have found out with several of our what we call smaller projects if you can call the seven million dollar tennis facility a small project uh, Compared you, to Mackey, that's very small. Exactly. And I know what small is too. Compared to the right. $70 million renovation of Ross Ade Stadium, there you go. Uh, there, there, there's certain Murphy's laws regarding those kind of projects. One is you will always, you, you'll, you'll conduct a small capital campaign, you'll go out and raise gifts, and you'll have a fair amount of success, but you will always be. 500,000, 700,000 short of what you need to do the project. So if you take a seven million dollar tennis facility, if you've raised six and a half million and now you're 500,000 short of being able to do it, um, you certainly don't want to give the six and a half million back because you can't. So you have to have a reserve, a resource to be able to top off these these projects. Just get that last little bit. It seems like we always ended up three or four hundred, th five hundred thousand dollars short yeah. and we just thought, you know, we've got ninety percent of the funding. We can't, we can't not do this project. So uh, uh, over the years we have really focused on being disciplined and um, I mean there's obviously a l unlimited needs that people have for those monies but uh, I, I've been extremely fortunate, and I've talked to my colleagues at the other Big Ten schools. I have an athletic director who is very disciplined and very diligent about how we manage resources. Um, and he'll stand his ground when the coaches come at him for right. the nickel-dime stuff. Fundraising and, and development is a big op would be a big operation because you don't get you do get you don't get money for the facility itself. We don't in, we don't uh, the state. we're a self supporting right. auxiliary enterprise, right. and the NCAA defines that as uh, the money that athletics generates exceeds the expenses, um, and we don't get any what are referred to as university allocated funds or subsidy. So no general funds, student fees, state right. funds. Okay. Um, and so we just, it's just like real life. You know, okay. you, you know. look at your checkbook and your savings account and that's it. That's it. That's what you, you have know. to work And uh, if you overdraft that, the bank doesn't call and say, well, we're going to cover it. They call and say, how are you going to cover <laughs> How are you going to cover that? And then of course they charge you more of what you already, they already know you don't have. So yeah. uh, you, you just have to be, I mean, we, we know the financial model that we're expected to work with, 
and uh, I'm just very fortunate to have an athletic director who nice. um, is, good is team. very, good team there. very disciplined and very diligent. And part of that is we'll have we'll generate a surplus, and, and we look at the laundry list of uh, things that people have, have asked for, and we don't we don't fund it down to the last dollar. We will set aside monies and build up a we reserve. Need- just like our rainy day funding. Exactly. Right? So that when these projects come along, uh, you've got those the last two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars to to top it off, and you don't have to not do the project. All right. Good point. Very well done. Um, Le- athletic directors from the Big Ten, you get together. Uh, it, it, the business managers and the ticket managers get together once a year okay. uh, in June. Um, now it has become more of a networking uh, kind of a meeting. I mean, with email and sure, right. uh, things like that. We don't that. need a meeting. We don't need a meeting. I mean, Just and uh, meeting. you develop a list serve, and, and when those questions come up, you send the question out, and within half a day, you're going to get you know ten ten responses back. So it's not so much about conducting business. Uh, it is an opportunity for the, uh, our primary contact up at the conference, who is the associate commissioner, Brad Traviola. He will give us um, pr- updated projections on major revenue sources that the Big Ten is going to be, you know, sh- sh- that we share within the Big Ten. Uh, but, but the communication part of it, in terms of just disseminating information, is, is maybe half a day. Yeah. It, it really is about seeing each other face-to-face at least once a year. And visiting and seeing what the facilities are. And on, seeing on what the, the other, th- yeah. Um, in fact, I was nice. just talking to my counterpart at, at uh, Illinois because they're hosting this year. We go alphabetically. Okay. And, and our meetings are always on campus. And so they're hosting this year, and um, she wasn't in that job the last time Illinois hosted. It's a woman who's head of the athletic director? Uh, the, oh, the business, business my role. business counterpart. Right. So she called me basically saying, okay, w- what do I do? And, and what are you all going to expect when you come over here? And they'd had some, and I said, well, one of the things, you know, certainly is uh, we will want to tour any newly renovated or new facilities that you have. Um, that's how we maintain a perspective of is this good enough, uh, you know, it, compared to what others have. Um, if you don't get off campus and see what your competition well, it's has like what you were saying, with. you do an on-site check of the hotels to be exactly. sure to decide which one you have to be there. You know? All right, sorry. Uh, but I've been confronted in the last three or four years by members of the State Budget Committee um, who asked the question, and I think it's a legitimate question, um, why are you redoing Mackey? Isn't it good enough, uh, you know, given all of the other needs that you have? Um, and I have to be able to answer, no, it's not. And I have to be able to believe that because we're spending the money. But I also have to be able to back it up with some sort of, you know, substance in my response as to what, what is it that That's is... That's why they're asking the question. Exactly. And, and it's, what are we lacking that the, that the others have? Um, it's easy when I'm talking about our two newest facilities, which are um, softball, women's softball and women's soccer, because they're the newest. And at the time... Uh, given the resources we had, we built a facility that they could compete on and and the competition part of the facility, which is the field, uh, is is first class. But then, you know, you run out of money when it comes to the amenities like bleachers and uh, uh, public restrooms and concession stands. So when you go to softball and you go to soccer, which are Division I Big Ten programs, and they have porta johns, and you know the concession stand is a trailer that is wheeled out for the season. Um, it's pretty easy to argue that you know that's not even at a minimum standard for a, a Big Ten program. Um, so yeah, th- th- these visits to the other campuses I think are invaluable. I would think so. And uh, Susan over at Illinois said that uh, a couple of the people over there were going. Oh, you know, people aren't going to want to do a tour of the facilities. It gets old. And I said, well, Susan, not everybody will, but enough will that 
and, and we'll really need to see it. Plus, be good to offer. they just renovated their baseball stadium, and uh, we played over there last fall, so I, I had a chance to see it firsthand, uh, and it, it's very, very it's nice. nice. Um, so uh, other schools need to know. It, it, it's like anything else. Almost as soon as you get done renovating, because it takes three, four, five years, <laughs> Somebody else, you know, you're almost obsolete. You know, somebody else is, has already Understood. moved ahead of you. So, so the, we meet once a year. Uh, then we have a national association. It's called the Collegiate Athletic Business Managers Association, CABMA. It is, uh, it, it's under the umbrella of the National Directors Association. And uh, we meet also in June. Uh, usually it's the week before or the week after the Big Ten meetings. Um, and uh, it's the national version of the Big Ten meetings. The topics there are broader. Obviously, they're not conference specific. Right. But they certainly we get into things like um, um, taxability of uh, uh, different kinds of perks and benefits that you see in athletics that are typical for coaches, uh, uh, courtesy cars and complimentary right. tickets and things like that. And what Some are, of the amenities. That what are the tax implications? Um, although we are, you know, we're just a department of the university, which is a tax-exempt public institution. Um, any part of the university, and I actually ran into this when I was over in agriculture, any part of the university that uh, ha can, has a, a, you know, like a revenue-generating uh, program or activity that is not really related to our Purdue-exempt mission. Um, the IRS comes in and says, well, you're just running a little business there, and if you're in competition with others in town who are doing the same thing and have to pay taxes, why shouldn't you have to pay taxes on that? Sure. Uh, examples would be running a public golf course, right. a bowling alley, hotel. Um, Open it up. Uh, you know, advertising in football and men's basketball game programs. So those are the kinds of things that will get discussed at our national meetings right. because they really have applicability to right, everybody. Right, exactly. And they're, uh, how to respond to them or answer if you get a question or something along right. that line. Yeah. Right. Now the biggest act of your facilities, of course, the Ross Aid is finished. It was done, and now the, the Mackey one, and uh, that's coming. Main Street's coming along. It, it, it but is. But that weather, I think, has um, has stopped some of it. And it's pretty co been pretty cold. Uh, it's been uh, very cold. But can they uh, work inside? They work inside, and oh, see, so that's they? why you it it. Now does not look like there's that well, much got activity that going on. There. I don't know whether they're doing some bricking in the. It's hard to tell. No, I think it. they did stop. It, that's at the very end there, and they did stop the bricking okay. uh, because they they had enough work inside. As you as you go from that tip of that new addition south towards Mackey, uh, the we're going to be moving people into the new space from Mackey going north. And really, if you if you can visualize about half of that big new addition, the half that's closest to Mackey, they're going to be moving into their offices April one, which is about six weeks good. from now. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, once they had as much brick up as as you see, mm -hmm. they have been able to work indoors and get a lot of the indoor work done. And then when the weather breaks, they'll come back out and they'll start yeah. breaking that that yeah. those little remaining sections and finish up the work inside and it's really coming along because i had seen the sketch of what it was and it was really hard for me to visualize how it was going to be on northwestern but now i, I the picture's falling into place <laughs> it is and then you you've got some other things you're going to be working on i think too at uh yeah it, uh, and they really all do fit together although it isn't it again isn't always obvious to uh, people like the state budget committee and the sure. commission for higher education but um when we when we built the new uh, Grand Prix track out uh, really west of tennis and west of soccer, uh, I know a lot of people, because I mean, I, I heard the comments, uh, were questioning the location. Um, you know, there really aren't very good access roads out there. Uh, and boy, that just didn't look like it made any sense at all. And in an ideal world, you would do the construction sequentially to where people could see how obvious sure. it was. But uh, the Board of Trustees approved or, uh, the awarding of a contract to a company out of Indianapolis about two weeks ago to complete the work out there at what we refer to as the Northwest Site, which is where the two soccer fields are at, the indoor tennis 
facility. And if you go west on Cherry Lane between the two golf courses, and it'll dead end at McCormick Road. Which it does now. It runs which it does there. now. Okay. Uh, what we will be doing is continuing Cherry Lane west through that field, oh, okay. just straight, straight west, and it will connect into what eventually will be the 231 extension that comes around. So now between that extension of Cherry Lane and the Tennis Center and where Grand Prix is at, you can start visualizing a rectangle right. with with the, the soccer complex at the northeast corner of the rectangle, Grand Prix at the northwest corner, tennis at the southeast corner, and then someday indoor and outdoor track will be the southwest corner. And then in between soccer and Grand Prix, we will now be building a new baseball stadium. And uh, they, we had the kickoff meeting a week and a half ago. Um, I'm sure they're going to be doing a lot of preparatory work. You have to prepare the site. A uh, little easier out there because there's not much going on out there. Right, but right. they still have to have construction fencing and right. all of the safety stuff. Well, they can be doing that now. I mean, and of course, it's really been you know, fortunate that we've had this weather break uh, the last couple of days. <laughs> when, when, uh, when that is done, uh, part of that project is to uh, build the infrastructure, like extending Cherry Lane, Adding some parking lots, adding uh, they need parking. Parking uh, is going to be. They key. need parking, and uh, we will have a pedestrian thoroughfare that will run east and west, and divide that rectangle in half with the top half and the bottom half. So it'll go, it'll go between tennis and soccer, and then go straight west. Uh, the area between soccer and McCormick, which is now a grassy, sort of a triangle, will be paved. It'll be paved parking. So we'll get the parking in there, uh, the pedestrian walkway, uh, the extension of Cherry Lane, which, and then parking on the west side of baseball, which then becomes the parking for Grand Prix. So now you'll have the access right. road for Grand Prix, you have the parking. So it's just going to take a while longer. It just took a while longer. Right, right. Um, the, the company that is doing the project, we asked all of the companies uh, as an alternate how much more they would charge to accelerate the schedule and get it done by April 1 of 2012. Um, the tentative schedule we had w would have uh, projected it being done by June 1. And uh, their response was, it won't cost you anything extra. We said, well, we'll take that alternate then. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, speed it up. And, right. and uh, April 1 is really about the start of the big of the conference season for baseball. Sure. They play a lot right. of non-conference games before that. Yeah. So. Really, by June 30 of 12, which seems like a long way off, but it's 15 months, 14, I 15 months, Mackey will be completely done. This Northwest Site project will be completely done, other than maybe some punch list things and paying off a few bills. Uh, and, and then people will, will, and part of that Northwest Site project is to build the facilities for soccer. They will have a club, you know, a clubhouse and right. uh, 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 fan amenities, you know, public restrooms and concession stands, and and it will start looking like an athletic village. Right. From your description, now I get the picture. And then and it, it's just lucky to have that space. We're very fortunate to have the space. Um, that land. There's also the opportunity. There's enough space out there that if, if the university wanted to build a surface parking lot and then run shuttle buses, as they've looked long term at the parking and traffic problems on campus, uh, that's always been part of the uh, tentative plan, and there still is plenty of space out there. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I personally don't see us moving indoor and outdoor track out there until we can do both at the same time, and right now financially, yeah. you know, th th this will pretty well stretch all of our resources. Right. But and at that's the end, a good, that's a lot to accomplish. It is, and, and uh, I think I'd mentioned the last time we visited, I, you know, in, not only this position, but even when I was in ag, but particularly this position has provided me an opportunity to, to do things and go places and meet people and experience events, um, tremendous uh, athletic competition successes and then, you know, some, you know, <laughs> crushing defeats. Uh, 
but without a doubt, as I look back, the thing that will be the most memorable and the most visible will be uh, really the complete renovation of all of our, the facilities. Just looking at Ross Aid, Mackey, and this new Northwest site project is, is just about $200 million. And it will have taken 20 years and, and we will have really changed the landscape. And, and tying that into what Howard Taylor is doing over at Rec Sports for, for the athletic slash recreational facilities, it's just it's going it's to fair. change, change the, right. the whole yeah. landscape. And one of the reasons we needed to build a new baseball stadium out there is because Rec Sports really didn't have enough parking before they started the renovation. They're going to double their score of footage, so they, they now they they really have a, a huge need for parking. And the the most obvious place to put the new parking area is where our current baseball stadium is at. Yeah. So so we you know we we built the new Grand Prix track so that we could uh, move our two football practice fields up to where Grand Prix was at because we knew with this extension of Mackey we were going to lose that parking lot that was there, so we had to take the area that was the lower football practice field, make it a parking lot, um, and then moving baseball, as opposed to just renovating where it's at, uh, was really necessitated by rec sports need for, for parking. And, and so the, the two departments and the administration all kind of worked together to get the timing and the funding right. And, uh, and get the plan on paper. Get the plan on whatever. paper. There you go. And, uh, you know, because we get so many questions about you know, is this the right time to do this? And isn't it a lot of money? Uh, and, and of course, the answer to both of those is yes, it is the right time, and yes, it is a lot of money. But if you look at this 25-year master plan that we had, with all of the interim renovations, which now don't have to be done because we're taking care of the right. major renovation now, and with what we're able to do to Mackey, we don't really see the need for a new arena. Um, I mean, th at least for 25 or 30 years. This also eliminated um, two additional buildings that we were going to build that would, would be like annexes onto the IAF building, uh, it's just, to, just to create space. Uh, and, and this project uh, made those no longer necessary. So if, when I look at the interim renovations, these two buildings plus the new Mackey that that don't have to be done and projecting the cost of each of those out to when they would have likely happened, all of that would have been about $400 million that we are now addressing for about $120 million. So you'll hear Morgan say, you know, what we're doing now is it, it, we're accomplishing all these things at about one-third of what we thought it was going to cost us. Um, that's where he gets the number. So. Let me ask a question. Ra Lambert, you've done some renovations in Lambert, having made changes over time. Yeah, uh, Lambert is a, is a shared facility. Oh. Um, the, the Does that come under the athletic department, though? Well, oh. the field house where the track is at. Oh, okay. And then where the old indoor swimming pool was at was athletics. That's where they're doing the wrestling. And that's where they're doing the wrestling. Right. Now. Okay. That that's athletics. The rest of the building, which are the classrooms, etc is health and kinesiology okay. and obviously we have a, a real good working relationship sure. with okay. them uh, in fact we've got several of our staff teach classes over there sure. um, we've, we've done uh, some renovation to the, uh, the field house uh, but it's sort of spot emergent not emergency but really needed uh, uh, up upgrades uh, the, the track run, wears out after a while. I mean, it's just a rubber composite surface, and you know, maybe every 10 or 15 years you gotta sure. redo that. that. Um, did some painting in there just to brighten it up, new lights. Beyond that, really not a whole lot. Uh, the one that I think is fun is when we raise the capital to build the new aquatic center. We, we, the operation of that falls under the Vice President for Student Services, and it's expensive to ma to operate a facility, uh, oh, sure. aquatic center like that. It's eight hundred thousand to a million dollars a year, and really the only way they could do it was to uh, consolidate the operating budgets from the old Lambert pool. I think there was one in Memorial Gym, and then there was one over at Rex Sports. 
They're the outdoor pool. The outdoor pool. Right. So they cons- they closed those down and right. consolidated the operating budgets, and so they they so they can operate the one big sure. one. So the pool over in Lambert sat empty for about four or five years. <clears throat> one of the little projects we had on our twenty five year master plan was a new wrestling practice facility. They were practicing down in the basement of Mackey. Uh, if, if the room was big enough, but there were concrete columns that were about a foot square. Not the best. Every so often in the room, and you know they had to try to avoid those as they're wrestling around. It just wasn't a very good situation. And uh, I, I honestly don't know whose idea it was. Um, somebody had had some vision, and. Uh, Morgan went to, at that time, I want to say it was Tom Templin, was the uh, uh, department head at Health and Kinesiology, asked if they had any you know, future plans for that pool. And he said, well, we have a lot of plans for the space, but we don't have money, and I don't see us having money very soon. And Morgan said, well, can we take it over? We'd like to convert it into a wrestling practice facility. And uh, so the deal was struck. Um, we did the project, essentially filled it with fill and then uh, poured concrete over the top, uh, filled it up even with what would have been the deck uh, uh, it had the pool still been there, and then uh, constructed like a suspended wooden floor, much like a, a gymnastics floor where you see you know, the, the, the floor routines where they bounce a little bit right. and it's kind of springy, and then put normal wrestling pad on top of that. Uh, and it, it, it's a huge open area. They don't have any columns anymore to wrestle around, and they've got a a floor that bounces. And uh, it's it's just a terrific (laughs) facility. Our coaches are ecstatic. And I, it was under $500,000 to do that. So what a great use of space. Super. Somebody had. Just sitting there idle. Just sitting there idle. The light bulb went on. Right. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Family? Family. Uh Um, I have um, a, a... an adult son and daughter. Okay. Uh, my son Christopher is one seventy four. He'll be thirty seven. Okay. Uh, and uh, he works here at Purdue. Both oh. both my son and daughter went to Purdue. He works at Purdue in sponsored programs. Okay. Uh, and my daughter uh, went to Purdue, got her degree in uh, athletic training, mm-hmm. passed her certification, got her master's at Indiana State, uh, and now works for Methodist Sports Medicine. Uh, down in Indianapolis. Uh, the orthopedic uh, doctors that Purdue has used, Purdue Athletics have, have used for 30 years. Um, Is that Shelburne? Shelbourne. Okay. Um, and each of the doctors has a specialty. There's a shoulder doctor and a wrist doctor and an ankle foot doctor, and Shelbourne is the knee doctor. Uh, Molly works for the ankle foot doctor. Um, actually, the, the she works with the one she works with a junior doctor who works with the doctor that did John Hart's foot surgery about a month ago or six weeks ago. Sure. Uh, they also do a lot of work with the Indianapolis Colts. So um, they're both married. Um, they, uh, my son has a 10-year-old stepdaughter, and my daughter has two little ones uh, of their own, one six and one is 11 months old, um, you know, the light the light of my life um, <laughs> of course. and all of the stories you hear about being a grandparent is a lot more fun than being a parent it are just a hundred percent true <laughs> um, that's that's how those stories become stories you know because they are true most of the time they both actually live in Brownsburg okay. um, my daughter and her family live on the south side because she and her husband both work in the Indianapolis area and then my son and his wife live on the north side of Brownsburg because his wife works in the Indianapolis area, but he works at Purdue, and uh, they knew they were going to have to do the thing right. that a lot of Purdue faculty and right. staff do, which is you know live in the Zionsville or Lebanon area. They'd been visiting with my daughter and her husband, and they really like Brownsburg, and it's uh, it's it's really an easy. It's not a bad drive. It's not bad. Uh, other than the gas that he uses, sure. his drive doesn't take much longer than my daughter's and she goes to the north side of Indianapolis um, and it's really less stressful driving uh, unless there's weather but it's not stop and go it's not traffic right. it's not frustrating as long as the roads are okay, as long as the, roads are okay and the weather's okay and he's got satellite radio and he just and it's a you know 
as he said, you know, on the way home, it's a wind down time. So um, uh, I've, I've been a single parent for 30 years now. Um, we lost their mother uh, to uh, a battle with cancer when she was very young. She was 32 years old. Um, but my, my kids were six and three at the time, so I, I didn't get them like, you know, a, a completely uh, untrained. Uh, and they just, you know, people said, well, that must have been really hard. Well, obviously, in some ways it was. But as far as raising the kids, they're just great kids. So, it, I mean, they've, they've been really easy. Um, Is that a good dad? <laughs> I, I do have a long-term uh, partner, uh, Linda Bowman, who we've been together going on 16 years now. Um, she has a son and a daughter, and our kids knew each other in high school. Sure. They're, they're about the same age. Uh-huh. Um, but her son, and our daughters are very much alike, and our sons are very much alike. And so uh, her son is about six years younger than my son, and um, I just keep telling her to look at my son, and you know, th- there is a ray of hope, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> boys are boys, what can I say? <laughs> the, 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 the two daughters have just been straight arrows, you know, went to school, take care of business, got to, through school in four years, and and the two boys really are, are creative, artistic types, and so um, it's just taken them a while to sort of figure out what they wanted to do with their life, and uh, Chris is just doing great here, and uh, and Jeremy is just, Linda's son Jeremy just graduated from massage therapy school, and he lives in Boulder, which is exactly where he ought to live. Um, if you're familiar with Boulder at all, yeah, and uh, so I think he's, he he has found something now that he has a passion for. That's good. So sometimes it, it takes a little longer. It it, 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 comes it just does, yeah. and he's actually just about the age that Christopher was when he sort of got it together. You know? <laughs> uh, awards and honors that manager of the year you got from the college athletics. That's that very was, nice. That was very nice. It was very exciting. Was it a bit of a surprise, or how did they tell? It you? was it was a surprise because uh, I mean I knew that obviously I received a call from the nominating committee asking if I if I was comfortable with being nominated, and um, uh, I, I tell this story a little bit in jest, but it's it's absolutely a true story. I was. Uh, not only surprised, but but I was puzzled. It was like, you know, why do you feel like um, that I really belong on that roster with the other people who were on there who, who you know, were really well known because they'd been very active in the National Association. They were working their way up through the chairs. Okay. Uh, and, and I had not done that. Um, I have a a, a good friend, my colleague, my counterpart at Northwestern is a, is a good buddy, and I've known him for a long time. And uh, he clarified it for me that that morning when I ex- when I expressed that, and he said that well, we're we're trying to uh, get some diversity on the ballot, and we needed a short candidate. So I said, well, thank you, Steve, very much for that. Uh, I, I the only explanation I've got is um, I'm pretty active. Uh, with, with the questions and answers that come out on the national listserv. When, when schools shoot a question out and they, they're asking the other schools how you do things or how you're addressing certain things, I'm, I'm pretty active at responding to that for, for a couple of reasons. One, I've been in this job for 22 years, sure. so you got you know, the I, 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 there isn't much that they can ask that I haven't run into at one point or another. Or give some response of some sort. I can, yeah. give, I can give some res- some re- response. Um, I have really good staff who frankly do all of the heavy lifting over at the office, so I have the time to do it. Um, I have the time to, w- when a situation comes up, to investigate it further, to really deep drill, um, you know, what are these rules and what's, what's behind these rules and and uh, why, why are we doing things the way we're doing them? So that I can, when I answer a question, it's usually more than just how, it's why we do it the way we do it. Because frankly, a lot of the why is very uh, facts and circumstances specific. So it's one thing to know what you're doing, but if I don't n- understand your environment, I don't, I may conclude that what you're doing apl- you know, will fit It'll here and it may not. Maybe not right. So. Um, I think I had developed some name recognition 
because I, I do respond and I respond with pretty thorough answers that I, I think are helpful. And, uh, but that was, a, a, you know, I, I exhorted my colleagues, um, this is what these organizations are for. This is really why we have these organizations, is we're supposed to do this. And much as we like to think that something we're running into is unique and we're the first person ever to run into it, you know, not, <laughs> not hardly ever the case. Somebody out there has run into it and has some good, valuable information if they would take the time to share it. So I, I, think, that's that's, very nice, I think that's where the name recognition came up from. Yeah. How about a Purdue tradition? Purdue tradition. Um, start of classes every fall. Sounds good. That's a good one. That's, that's I, a I, new I, one. I, it's good. I think all of us who have been here this length of time, I mean, you get down to, there's lots of specific things you could point to, but it is that that renewed energy, that influx of new kids every fall. I mean, we always joke about this would be a great place to work if it wasn't for all the students. You know, but that usually has to do with parking and trying to, get, the, trying to get into yeah, a restaurant. Some of the responses I've gotten, and I think this is good, the commencement. Uh, some of them are on the stage and to see them cross, you know, and, and that's... No, that really is nice. The Boilermaker Special is another one that people in homecoming. And also some people have shared they missed over the years because we used to have, well, they still have the parade. But used, remember the, the residence halls used to have uh, awards for their decorations and things yes. outside there, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of some of the people remember that. Um, outstanding event? You can have more than one if you want. Boy, that is, that is so hard. Um, That's okay. Be, because there have been so many exciting events okay. uh, in the 22 years. Um, but if I could just name a couple, certainly the Rose Bowl, uh, the football team going to the Rose Bowl, uh, irrespective of the fact that we didn't win the game, just the event. And there was a, uh, and that was the fourth bowl in a row that we had had. Uh, the first one after a long drought was the 97 Alamo Bowl, followed by the 98 Alamo Bowl. 99, we went to the Outback in Tampa. And then after the 2000 season, it's always referred to as the 2001 Rose Bowl because it was on January 1st. I know. But it was really the 2000 season. <laughs> right. We, <clears throat> you know, we were out there. Um, we had a pep rally that, depending on who you talk to, had 35,000 people at the pep rally, and the weather was beautiful, and um, it was just a memorable event. Uh, certainly the women's 1999 national championship and I was at that uh, Linda and I were were part of the travel party we were part of the celebration in the hotel afterwards we we had possession of the of the national trophy um, the ride back on the charter plane with the team uh, it, just memorable uh, but then there are the the little backstories. Uh, men's basketball played in the first, second round of the NCAA tournament in Boston. Uh, Bryden Carnell was still with us, so it had to be about 99, 98, 99. And uh, we won both games, and we weren't expected to win either one. And it was, uh, the second game was on a Sunday. It was later. Our charter plane was running really late. Uh, I, in all honesty, I think they had forgotten about the time, time change. I, it, they were coming out of the Midwest, and I think they forgot we were an hour later. Um, and it started snowing. And if you know anything about Boston, they only need about a half an inch of snow to close the airport because it's just right on the water there. And it's starting to snow, and it's big flakes. And I'm like, where's my plane? And I've got the team, and I've got a pep band. And, uh, and we were split up. But we had made arrangements for the pet band and cheerleaders to go get something to eat. And uh, we ended up with the team in a little pub that's like a cheers kind of pub. Um, just sitting there talking with Coach Katie and his wife and, you know, ch you know, just chatting with the players. Just that informal, like you int do cheers. intimate. Exactly. Yeah, and, right. and sitting there thinking, you know, for an accountant, this is pretty unique. <laughs> Sounds good. This is pretty unique. <laughs> and so there, there are a number of those sort of just little 
human interest kind of stories. But obviously the Rose Bowl for football, the uh, uh, national championship for women's basketball were good choices. Big. Good. Uh, in closing, a look at Purdue intercollegiate athletics, 21st century in the second decade. Any comments? Uh, I think, um, you know, Morgan and I have talked. Um, I've been in this job for 22 years. Probably have a, uh, w when Mackey is finished, uh, which July 1 of 12, I'm going to go part, you do the early voluntary partial retirement. I mean, uh, at, I'm 64 now. I'll be almost 66 at that time. Uh, Morgan may have two to three more years after that. Our goal was to leave the program in as solid a financial um, condition as we could, and I think we're doing that, to address all of the facility deficiencies, and, and I think we will leave the, the physical plant in very good shape. And then to make sure that uh, for all of our sports, and then from a financial point of view, particularly our four revenue sports, that we have left them in the hands of really good young, of course to me young is 40, 45, uh, good young coaches who are, are being successful and love Purdue, want to be at Purdue, and hopefully will be there 10 or 15 years after we've gone. So I think that's Purdue athletics. Um, the harder one is athletics nationally. Uh, there is really a financial crisis going on, and it, it's it, very hard. It, to Chronicle covers that. Inside Higher Ed covers it. There too. is um, there, but it, and, and they refer to it as a financial crisis, and everybody talks about the situation. They don't really talk about why the situation exists, and 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 my. My read of it is um, it, it's because of decisions that are being made based on emotion, not based on logic and rationale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, University of Texas pays their football coach $5 million. I, I don't understand how you can rationalize that um, and make that make sense. But clearly they do. I mean, that's, that's approved by the president of the Board of Trustees. So. You know, we want to be a nationally prominent athletic program that's excellent in all respects. Well, that means we have to be able to at least at some level, with all of our sports, compete with a Texas, an Ohio State, um, Southern California. I mean, I can go, you know, Florida, I can go on and on. A and yet, um, there are so many programs out there that. Uh, whether they acknowledge it or not, are, are making statements about their value judgment by the decisions they're making or by the decisions they're avoiding making uh, in terms of we need to cut back yeah. on the university. Um, and I don't, I don't, I can't see where that's, I can't see the end of that. Uh, but I can't see it going on forever either. So yeah. it's, I'll be interested, to, I mean, I expect to be an observer, and I'm going to watch and see what happens. And, and if, if at some point something really systemic changes, what is it that's going to cause it to change? Right. Um, you know, those programs that funnel significant amounts of university funds into athletics, um, at some point they're going to have to have a crisis of conscience. An ongoing discussion, but it's current for this particular decade, I think. But, but yeah. ultimately, uh, each school has all the control they want to have. That's right. And ultimately, it comes down to the president and the governing the boards. Board. Right. They point. have to make a decision. That's right. We've made a decision at Purdue and had made it a long time ago that we're going to be self supporting. and we're, But we're going, given that financial model, we're still going to strive to be the best we can possibly be within the financial resources we have. Um, so, you know, I, mean, I, I, I bristle at, at when people use the phrase, well, you know, good enough. I mean, isn't it good enough? Um, well, is that really what you aspire to be? <laughs> <laughs> but we aspire to be the best we can possibly be given the resources that we have. Good point, yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.